we are taught as Native Americans to plan and to think in terms of generations. Generations are more important than five and 10 and 15 year plans. What we do here in our short lifetime is not for us, it's not for me, it's for those future generations that we're always working for. Those are the values that we must maintain as people on this earth. Those are the values that have been passed down from generation to generation. We've been taught as Native Americans to think in terms of seven generations down the road. That's, that's how we plan and how we deal. And what we do today, we're hoping that will affect seven generations from today. Well, the tribal people have a saying, water is life. My blood is from water. The fish is my food. So like any community of people, uh, water is life. It, uh, it sustains everything. And so people, whether they're Indian people, they migrate to those areas and they live in those areas where water is accessible. In this morning's prayer, I ask the water, my brother, the water, to give me the wisdom and open this heart and mind to understand the secrets of the water. Our connection goes back to time immemorial. Water was a transportation route for social purposes, for trade, for war. These, these were the battleships of the old days. And these were the ferries, much like you have today. This whole uh, filtration plant is a very special project for Seattle. It's um, an effort to improve the quality and reliability of the water supply for citizens in Seattle. The source water comes out of the South Fork of the Tolt River. The water comes from pristine watershed, and we need the extra 11 million gallons a day that the Tolt supply will produce. You make a number of commitments when you go into an area that's environmentally sensitive. And one of the things we knew in advance was that uh, there had been tribes uh, that were attributed to have lived in this area. is that uh, the site is up to 8,000 years of age. We're finding artifacts and uh, uh, flakes, what they call archaeological flakes, from the surface to over a meter and a half down into the ground. I don't know that we've everybody's figured out all the different uses of microblades, but they're a composite tool. Yeah. And, and kind of See, this came off probably anything. a big crystal, big crystal. like that. Yeah. The name of the village is called Stoyuk. In our Lushushi language, it means the throat. And as you can see, this is a deep canyon. And what would happen in the summertime is that the air and everything else would come through this canyon and air dry salmon. The village that uh, where we're doing an archeological uh, excavation, a lot of our ancestors had lived there, but mostly lived on this river and fished and hunted in the area. This archaeology site is a bridge from my past to the future of the people of this county and city. It's very important that as we excavate this site, that we, all of us, not just the tribe nor the city or other natives that are going to be involved, that we all need to cross this bridge together. This is the base oh. right here. And this area up here. Was that will help build a foundation of education and so that when we tour or uh, bring out to the public these artifacts, everybody can attain an education about how the Snoqualmie people were and are trying to be today. 
I've got the completed form and recovery test. We have a number of tribes in the Puget Sound area that have been active in all of our uh, different water facilities. We've had major interactions with the Muckleshoot and the Cedar. We've worked with the Tulalips and the Snoqualmie tribes around the Tolt. Here at Tulalip, uh, currently we're sighted you know, by the bay, Tulalip Bay, it's what the tribe took the name after. We have actually about nine tribes who settled here under the treaty. But historically, uh, the tribe was made up of uh, different tribes, different bands that uh, scattered up and down uh, the Snohomish River and this Tulalip Bay, uh, Woodby Island, Camino Island, uh, and, and traveled extensively. Know, throughout Puget Sound, up into British Columbia, and as far north as southeast Alaska. Uh, this beautiful Puget Sound, as they call it now, it's important for us to, to keep that connection and to have our blessings for the fishermen and the, and the blessings for the fish. Well, the salmon ceremony, in short, is uh, the, the first salmon returning to us. Uh, the tribe has to, to welcome the, the salmon people and assure the salmon people that the tribe as always will have a relationship with the salmon and care for the salmon and assure uh, its existence as well as our own. But this is all a form of our relationship with the creator, the relationship with the salmon and our community and how we work to, to keep ourselves healthy. We are situated on a facility that we call the White River Hatchery. This is our way to help the spring salmon, our brother. Among the salmon people, the spring salmon is the highest above all. He is the king, king salmon. Uh, in our language, he would be siat. He would be above all salmon people. He is the first salmon people to visit every year after the long winter months. As you can see, they're illustrated as the salmon people, where the male and the female come together. And we should view these salmon people as our brother, not just a fish who lives in the water. They are a people that we need to try to uh, treat them accordingly, treat them as such a brother, treat them as a neighbor, be a good neighbor to these people. The obvious thing from an Indian perspective is that water is our lifeblood. We have to protect water. It has to be pure water. It has to be quality water, so to speak, so that we can sustain our lives. And in order to sustain that and to preserve that, we need to go back and see how it was preserved in the past. Uh, the lake. Uh, provide so many different things uh, spiritually it's a place to go to to meditate and to to uh, communicate if you will to to those people that have gone on also you need to view it as an equal as we've been taught to from generation to generation it is not something that we go out and trying to conquer Flathead Lake and the other waters on the reservation have always been critically important to the people of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. The lake, because it's such a, a, a beautiful and valuable natural resource, has always been hotly contested. People want to control it, own it, use it. Development has become a major problem. This is the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. It was of the highest quality of lakes. In years past, we have de we depended on it uh, to help us in our lives, and in turn, we try to preserve and to protect the, the waterways and the lakes as, as an equal because we help each other. We treat the, the water as a, uh, with great respect, not to be uh, polluted or contaminated, especially 
You know, I think that's what, uh, in a sense, that's what that means, uh, treating it as an equal. One of the interesting things of my job as a lawyer is that I believe that the council looks to me because I'm a tribal member to preserve and bring with my ideas of how we protect water rights, a recognition of a cultural perspective that, that the tribes have. What has happened is the traditional cultural belief about water has somewhat been tempered by laws and court decisions and a number of other things that have come from the federal government. Uh, as an example, in the old treaties, Indians were always guaranteed water. One of the weaknesses was that it did not quantify how much or what for. The wording in the old treaties may have said something like, as long as the rivers flow and as long as the grass shall grow, you are entitled to water. It didn't say how much or what you can use it for. For instance, does ownership allow Indians to buy it, sell it, lease it, give it away, do something else? Or does the old original language imply that they only have it if they put it to their own use? Nobody knows. That's why it's such a convoluted question now. I think if you look on the tribal map, a good probably 99% of the, the lakeshore property is privately owned. So, you know, they were boosted out of that. And I remember in the other bay, this bay here, they call this Kupkawutskonuk uh, Nana, the bay we just come from where Elmo's at is Kupkawutskonuk. And uh, they used to talk about uh, the old timers making rafts and, and going along at night with, uh, with a fire on the, they'd build a little fire on the raft and going along and uh, spearing fish, getting fish out of the lake for that. You know, you don't see that, or you, you'll get picked up if you do that, you know. <laughs> it's against the law now. <laughs> it goes back to a basic recognition that we created this relationship with tribes over the last 200 years where we create reservations, and those reservations are supposed to be homelands. Um, early in the century, in 1908, uh, the Supreme Court had recognized that any time that an Indian tribe had a reservation, they needed water in order to have that to be a, a homeland, a viable homeland. And from that point on, it became a growing body of law that came out of the Supreme Court that said that the United States has a trust responsibility in Indian tribes. Good morning, the Indian Affairs <coughs> Committee will be in session. Trust status. That means the federal government, when they negotiated with the tribes to give up a lot of their land, they took on willingly at the time the advocacy of Indian issues. We have, we have to solve this problem. When Indians come to Congress, they are looking for Congress to implement the promises that they made a long time ago through the treaties. What they are saying is that this trust responsibility is not being implemented the way it was supposed to be. And little by little, we're losing sovereignty. We're losing ground. The single primary driving force for Indians is not to gain more. The driving force is not lose any more than we've already lost. Hang on to what little we've got left before it's all gone. In an environment where water is at a minimal resource, that becomes first and foremost as to how you're going to live, how you're going to sustain yourself. That's, that's the foundation of all life. I talk to a lot of tourists who come out to the reservation and they're amazed at how we're able to survive out here. And generally, you know, my response is, well, I don't survive out here. I live out here. Water is our lifeblood. We are farming people. Uh, our elders have always farmed. And um, so you depend on the rain, the moisture for your farming. And so because we're already in a water short area, uh, we are constantly, our, our activities, uh, the prayers that we, that we make every day and our ceremonies that we have uh, this time of the year is the katsina season. And katsinas are our messengers who deliver our prayers to bring rain, to bring moisture to the area. If you take a look at the Kachina doll carvings, many of these dolls 
are expressions of rain or different aspects of rain, uh, moisture, those types of things. So a doll like this, you may notice has terraced figures on there. Well, those are clouds. Uh, the feathers that you see up here are also representations of clouds. Everything that we do is with moisture to bring rain out here. So uh, water is very sacred to us. Most all of our ceremonies require that we go visit our springs and use the water from the, the from water from our sacred springs. Water is the most important thing to the Hopi. Our religion comprises of daily prayers for water. Our religious activities and songs and dances involved praying for water. Our religion is our life as Hopi. You simply have to look at what Hopi stands for. Hopi is a philosophy that is built around the theme of water, land, and all the blessings that are derived as a result of it. And Hopi simply functions religiously and culturally within this theme of water. The Hopi view of everything is something called uh, forever. And that's really how the Hopi thinks. This earth has to survive. In my own personal teachings, there is no other world. There is no concept of a heaven to escape to. This is it. We have to make wise use of our resources so that the future generations do have the benefits of what we call earth. Southwest is a very special place when it comes to the issues of water. Um, the largest land-based tribe is the Navajo, but they are the most recent group of people to come here to this area. And for the Pueblo people, that includes the Pueblos in New Mexico and um, Zuni Pueblo and the villages of Hopi, we do see the Hopi as the, um, the original people. And with regards to um, respectfulness to the, the culture, to the land, and to water, um, they really are the people that um, we look to in that because they've chosen not to um, change as much as other people have and have become more um, connected to the lifestyle of living in a, an arid climate and to survive with a um, minimal amount of resources and so that the world could survive and teach others how to survive. They're drawing out 400,000 acre foot of water from the N aquifer, the Navajo aquifer, which the Hopi is dependent upon. And this water is uh, one of the best pristine groundwaters that we refer to our in aquifer. And uh, if we allow this pumping to continue, sooner or later, you know, we're gonna dry up the uh, groundwater and it'll take thousands of years to recharge. I'm looking for the future of our children. What's gonna happen to us if, we, if that runs out? Where are we gonna get our water? Today, there are four federally recognized tribes that live in the state of Maine. The Penobscot Reservation is um, on a series of islands in P uh, Penobscot River. The Passamaquoddy uh, have two reservations in far eastern Maine, Pleasant Point, which is right on um, Cobscook Bay, and the Peter Dana Point, or Indian Township Reservation. The name Passamaquoddy is actually a uh, Passamaquoddy word, Bestamukad. Uh, Bestamukad uh, is, uh, the loose translation is uh, uh, people who fish Pollock. I think that that in and of itself goes right to the heart of what and who Passamaquoddy people are, in that uh, Pollock is a fish, 
Uh, the fish swims in the ocean, and uh, that's where we uh, have historically, culturally, and to this day, uh, receive all of our uh, bounty, our sustenance, our livelihood from. It's from the sea. Water life is very sacred in the estimation of my people. It has been since the Creator has put us here as uh, caretakers of this uh, part of Mother Earth. The uh, whale, for instance, is a uh, messenger from uh, what we call Lumpbeg, the underwater life. And uh, we pay homage to the whale, and we, we even have a song, uh, one particular song in Passamaquoddy, and we have a, a Micmac song that we do, me and my wife. And um, well, we put tobacco in the water at times to honor the whale and uh, uh, ask the whale to uh, give us knowledge and, and, and protection. Uh, and uh, we also, every time we pray in, in the uh, to water, we give tobacco to the water, we ask that, uh, that they bring uh, plenty of uh, porpoise to us. Uh, as we think of the porpoise, uh, it is a part of our family. Uh, we, are, we always give uh, thanks and praise to the porpoise every time uh, some of the hunters come in with porpoise. Uh, when we uh, share in the feast of the porpoise, we give thanks with the tobacco when we pray. Uh, and ask for forgiveness uh, when we do uh, consume the porpoise meat. <laughs> My perspective, having been, I think, literally raised on, on Passamaquoddy Bay and the Bay of Fundy, and the fish we were catching when I was young, about 30 years ago, were haddock, halibut, cod, flounder, salmon. Uh, my father would tell me that by the time I reach his age, there would be no more. The fish were, were dying. As I was growing up, you know, we, we used things from all the water, such as the seaweed and the driftwood and the rocks because they, they all work together. And that's the spiritual part about it. And we got to keep that heritage going, you know, because it's part of our culture. And it's part of us. This water is part of us. The relationship between the, the people of the Penobscot Nation and the river here is a very intimate relationship, and it, it's a result of uh, thousands and thousands of years of uh, use of this river, uh, basically to meet all of the needs of the, the members of the tribe. Even as, as uh, recent as 50 years ago, uh, many members have uh, consistently used fish from the river here to, to supplement their their diet, you know, to help with the grocery bill. And that's all changing. When we talk about the relationship of the Passamaquoddy to the water, we live here around Passamaquoddy Bay. And at the headwaters of this bay, there's a river now called the St. Croix River, which was named by French explorers in, in the early 1600s when they came here. Every single aspect of Passamaquoddy life was and, and still is affected by this river. The mode of transportation was canoe. And the, the canoes were made out of, out of birch bark and used right up until the, uh, the middle of this century. Water was the highway from the coast into the interior of Maine. You really see a strong orientation to people living near water sources. About 90% of the archaeological sites that we have discovered in the state of Maine and know about are situated within a, a hundred feet of water. Beaver pelts, for example, would have been extremely uh, sought after. Moose hides, other furs, but also ideas, and, and a couple of those ideas, for example, do include the, the birch bark canoe, which is absolutely the, the best uh, watercraft to get around on any of these lakes and streams and ponds in order to exploit those resources that some of these early traders were interested in. 
everybody likes to ponder about the question, well, how did people come about building a birch bark canoe, you know? Was it some magical dream or, or what? And the use of birch bark in our culture is used for wigwams and, you know, housing and, and bowls, uh, clothing and so many things that when you, when you work it, you understand its properties. And I think over time, people understood that you know, this material can be used to float things down the river. It was a must to have a birch bark canoe. And I can't imagine any family 300 years ago not being actively involved in the, in the making of a birch bark canoe. The duties sort of spread themselves out where more often than not, the gathering of materials and the carving of all the wooden members is uh, the male job and the, and the sewing of the roots and sewing of the sheets of bark is, is the female job. So I think a, a small family in, in the course of four or five days would have a canoe completely finished. So there's a very, very strong spiritual connection here that has evolved over 10 to 15,000 years. This river is, is very much central to the, the lives of the Penobscot Nation. At the same time, water as a lifeblood is more than just sustenance. It's also very religious. We see it as lifeblood. We see the rivers as essentially the veins of Mother Earth. Wiggly, howdy, 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 wiggly, howdy,